My name is Andras Sulushina. Um, this is the longest, possibly the longest Hungarian name you have ever seen. So my students used to call me uh, Professor Andras something something. Uh, so perhaps you could stick to that uh, habit. Uh, we will have sp three speakers today to set the stage. I'm going to be the first one uh, to talk about the global water issues. And then comes uh, Professor Bogardi here, who talks about water and uh, migration. And then we have Professor Galanchir here, who will talk about, uh, well, atmospheric sciences related to uh, water, the water cycle, uh, and what the science issues behind that are. So uh, the title of this, uh, this course, uh, the Summer University, what you have is Surviving Crisis. And I hope you will forgive me that uh, I'm talking about yet another crisis, which perhaps uh, most of you are not familiar with, because you came from different backgrounds, international studies, law, uh, and things like that. And very few people, unfortunately, including the politicians, recognize that one of the most important issues of the 21st century is going to be water. So what I will talk about uh, is uh, the state of water resources in the world that would provide the boundary conditions to zoom down to Europe, to this particular region, and to this small country, which is simply not existing without considering the larger picture, the big, big picture. Uh, I'm, I'm here, I'm a researcher at the, at the, at the institute, it's supposed to be the, the plumber dealing with uh, water issues. Uh, the presentation uh, will be structured according to what you will see in here. First, I try to set the stage, what the problems are, what are the most important drivers that the dry water as, uh, as an emerging, extremely important global issue. Some even say if, if humanity is able to survive, or rather to avoid a nuclear holocaust, then the next issue to fix is going to be water. Uh, there are some very simple messages here. Uh, you can live uh, without internet for 10 days. I know it's difficult. You can live... Uh, without uh, love for 15 days. But I, I can do it for longer than that. But uh, for the younger, it's difficult. But you just cannot do that uh, without water. So the, the message is so powerful and so simple. And yet, we as square-headed scientists were not simply able to transmit that message uh, to the policy-making community or rather to the political community. And the third part of the talk will deal with the impacts. How our, how, how our systems respond to those drivers. And then the, the, the last part is going to be devoted to some of the fun parts, you see, data, modeling, new technologies, uh, innovation, and that kind of stuff. So let me just start with uh, uh, making the, the case. First of all, does anybody know how much water we have, fresh water? But you are not supposed to talk, okay? Uh, well, if you look at all the water resources of the world, oceans, freshwater resources, 97.5% of, of the total water is in the oceans. Uh, what remains, 60% of, of, of that is in, 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 in the shape of ice, in the Arctic, in the permafrost, in glaciers, in the Alps, high altitude uh, mountains. And of, of what remains, 90% of that is invisible, is under the ground. <coughs> so what is available for immediate human consumption in lakes, reservoirs, and rivers is a very, very small, a tiny fraction, only 0.007% of the total water resources of the, of, 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 of the world. That little dot which you see uh, down there. This is what the hydrologists call the James Bond phenomenon. So if you look at the total resource, including marine resources, 0.007% of the total resource is the one that is available for immediate human consumption in lake reservoirs and rivers. On top of all, that water is not being uniformly distributed. Some of the continents are lucky, such, for instance, the, the Latinos, 
the Europeans are more or less okay, but where the big issue is, is, is probably coming, and that's where the, the, the large part of the looming crisis is, and this is what people normally don't recognize, is Asia. Where 60% of humanity lives with roughly 36% of the resource. And of course the arid zones, uh, Maghreb and all the way down to the Maastricht and the North Africa and all the rest of it uh, is, 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 is where the, the problems are. Now in, in Africa you may say that well there's more or less an equilibrium, more or less. But there is this region called the Sahel region, Sahel in Arabic means transition. The Sahel region, which is in between Sub-Saharan Africa and, and, and North Africa, which has a huge hydrological variability. So sometimes there are floods, flash floods, but most of the time there are uh, droughts. Droughts and droughts and, and droughts, and that's where the problem is. Now, uh, let's see how much water we use of what is available. Mind you that 007 percent is, uh, is a mere 41, roughly, grosso modo, 41,000 cubic kilometer water, which is available for human uh, consumption immediately. Of course, uh, groundwater was not regarded here. Now let's see what are the patterns in, in, uh, in using water. Alone in the, 60th century, in the 20th century, water withdrawal has been six-tuppled while the population growth was threefold. And clearly there is a gap in between the number of users and the amount of water which they are using. While uh, at, the, at the beginning of the century it was uh, roughly half, a, uh, well, roughly 500 uh, uh, cubic kilometer water that was used, by the end of the 20, 20th century we almost hit the 4,000 uh, uh, cubic kilometer uh, value, which is critical from the point of view of sustainability. Uh, I borrowed the next slide from, uh, from Rockström, uh, who uh, reported in a, uh, in, a, in a paper about the, the planetary <laughs> boundaries, the planetary boundaries of certain variables that sustain human life. And he argues that if we go beyond the planetary values, then uh, issues will become irreversible. He argues that we are beyond the point of no return in biodiversity loss. He argues uh, that, uh, although he changed his view a little bit lately, uh, he argues that this is the same uh, with the climate uh, change and the carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas releases into the atmosphere. And that paper was, of course, published before the, the Paris Agreement. And he sets a value of 4,000 uh, cubic kilometers, which is, a, which is a, 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 a tipping point beyond which, if we go, our freshwater systems will collapse. Now, we are right there. Uh, it's about 4,200 uh, cubic kilometers. So there is a... Uh, a, 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 a crisis with respect to water. The crisis is so powerful that even the spy agencies have recognized the importance of that. The, the U.S. National Security uh, Agency has published a, a, a report entitled uh, Global Trends in 2030. Where will the world will be by, by that time? And they, they say that in that report that there will be four principal drivers, four principal megatrends that will shape uh, the, the world in 2030. The, the, the empowerment of the individual, the diffusion of power, demographic patterns, and the, the nexus between food security, water security, uh, and energy security. Now, this morning we will talk about the last two, and I'm sure the, the, the power issues and the political issues other speakers will uh, talk about. So this spy agency has also reported that water may become a more significant source of contention than energy or minerals out of the 2030s uh, at both the interstate uh, and interstate uh, level. Uh, the profession was shouting, I mean, uh, for two decades that the crisis is looming, and nobody has really read the writing on the wall. Two years ago, for instance, however, there has been a change, uh, and this slide I, I copied from the, uh, the um, 
Davos uh, uh, Economic Forum uh, risk report, which says, and that was uh, right after the migration started to come uh, to Europe, that says that, uh, well, for the next uh, six, 18 months, and now we are basically behind, beyond that 18 months, uh, large-scale involuntary migration, state collapse, instated conflicts, unemployment, failure of national governance, these will, will be the big global drivers. But for the, and this is more or less, you know, this is what happened. Now, if you look at the next 10 years, however, they claim that, uh, and I have to tell you, this was a, a Delphi type of, uh, of, uh, of expert opinions. It, was, it is not based on modeling, it is not based on databases, it is not, it's a scenario, uh, not even a scenario assessment. Experts were asked, what do you think, what's going to happen? <laughs> so what came out is that for the next 10 years, water crisis uh, is, is, a, is a very important phenomenon, immediately followed by the failure of climate change mitigation. And they basically say that this is the failure of the P Paris Agreement implicitly. And third, extreme uh, weather events, food crisis, uh, and uh, last, but not least profound social instability. And the question is, what connects them all? That's water. That, that's whether you talk about extreme weather events, floods, typhoons, heat waves, uh, atmospheric circulation. It's all, about, it's all about water. But of course, humans are principally uh, interested in how much water they can have for drinking purposes. This is, the short, this is the, the matter of survival. And that is why at the turn of the, 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 the century or the millennium, the UN uh, cobbled together a global agreement called the Millennium Development Goals, year 2000 Special Assembly of the UN, with the principal objective of halving the number of human beings who are living under absolute poverty by 2015. That means one dollar income a day, less than one dollar income a day. And then to achieve that goal, there were a number of sub-goals. Two of them were related to water, six goals, seven goals rather. Two of them were related to water. One of them was related to, uh, to water supply. At that time, and that was 17 years ago, there were 1.4 billion human beings who had no access to drinking water. And the UN was smart enough not to define what drinking water means. Whether this is a, a, a water from the pond, this is water from a, a, a pipeline system, is it safe from a, a biological or chemical? It's just drinking water. This is what the diplomats called intended ambiguity. So it was left uh, uh, for later uh, uh, discussion. But what happened after uh, 15 years, now we have uh, even according to those loose criteria, we have 780 million people who have no access to whatever quality drinking water. So my boss, uh, the former Secretary General, has announced Urbi at Orbi at the end of 2015 that we have reached the millennium goal on water supply. Not quite, because if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, the situation is really bad. It will take yet another 60 years for Sub-Saharan Africa to reach the Millennium Development Goals. And Africa depends on, on water. The whole development in Africa, and also migration, as Janos will show, it depends on access to water. Every second patient in a hospital in Sub-Saharan Africa is there because of water, or rather because of the, the lack of, of good, good water. 90% of the diseases in Sub-Saharan Africa are caused by water. So this is a huge risk for Africa, but for the whole globe. If you look at it in a topologically <coughs> correct, but otherwise a distorted representation in terms of uh, uh, the area proportional to non-access to water, what you will see here, that basically in this regard, Europe doesn't <coughs> exist. Because all you do is you just open the tap and you got the water. Uh, at, at the price that Europe has lost the water culture. If you ask a, a young child, where is the water coming from? The water is coming from the tap. Uh, they, it, it, it totally, they totally lost, uh, the younger generations totally lost the, the culture, which is very much present in Africa, for instance. Basically, uh, virtually North America doesn't exist. Where the problems are is Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and China. 
That will require huge investments, but at the same time, it provides huge business opportunities. One dollar investment in the African water supply and sanitation system saves you four dollars at the level of the national economy. This, this is the big enemy uh, for, for, for development. That's water supply. But the situation with respect to sanitation is much worse. Uh, at the beginning of this uh, century, there were 2.4 billion human beings who had no access to what you can call minimum sanitary uh, requirements. Uh, a pit latrine, okay? That's the, that's the minimum. 2.4 billion people had no access to that. Now, after 15 years, instead of having the situation improved, it's worsened. We have now 2.6 billion human beings who have no access to minimum sanitation. Of course, it's a moving target because the population increase was quite, well, quite significant. But this is a, 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 a time bomb. That is the million of development goals. And because the business was not finished, unfinished business, governments get together again to negotiate the next round. But ethically, you can ask the question, why is it that just half of the humanity should be, uh, absolute poverty line should be eliminated? Why not the whole thing? Because it's a staggered approach. So the second 15 years is now de dis well, designed or, or, or is driven, hopefully, by the Sustainable Development Goals, which is, again, an intergovernmental agreement of all the, 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 the countries. That was signed, again, at the UN General Assembly, although it's not a binding agreement. And we will talk about the SDGs, as they are called, a little bit later, where water is a, a centerpiece. Now, let's move on towards, uh, well, making the case uh, about disasters. This chart, which I, I borrowed from the Zurich, uh, uh, reassurance company shows you the number of disasters recorded in the 20th century. Uh, well, basically our communication systems are better, our data collection systems are better, reporting systems are, are better. That's why we have uh, an exponential increase visibly in, in the disasters. But if you look at the total disasters by the end of the the total number of disasters by the end of the 20th century, what you see is a good 90% of them are water-related. Tsunamis, flash floods, droughts. Floods are big killers. But the biggest killer of all is flash flood. Well, here is a summary of where we are. Uh, and these figures are really, uh, really frightening. 85% of humans live in, in arid areas. By 2030, half of the population will be living in areas of high water stress. Africa and Asia. Well, the other figures I, I, I mentioned, six to eight billion people are killed every year <coughs> by uh, water. 6,000 children are, are, are killed every single day uh, by, by water or by the lack of, of, of water. More than 80% of the Pollution load, what humanity generates, goes untreated to the coastal areas. And that changes the ecosystems of the marine systems. So the land-based pollution, 80% of it, goes directly to the, to the oceans. And later on, we will talk about the transboundary uh, waters, how many aquifers and catchments are being shared. Now, let's turn. Uh, Again, in making the case uh, to, the, to the climate change. This is a big topic now. Everybody speaks about uh, climate change. Is it a, a, a good thing or is it a bad thing? Some say that the most negative impact of climate change will be that the English will start making wine again. Uh, but that's, of course, not true. Uh, some say that, uh, but there will be positive impacts because uh, this will be good for the, the tourist industry. Uh, the temperature will go up in the coastal zones and there will be more tourists coming. And that certainly is a positive impact. But that is, ladies and gentlemen, the only positive impact what we have seen so far. All the other impacts of climate change will be negative. 
We're very negative uh, for several reasons. This is, a, this is not a tsunami. This is a, a flood in Japan. Not, that's not my, not my uh, shot. Uh, it's an overtopping of a levee, of a dike, of a river, because the Japanese rivers are very short. The relief energy of the catchment areas is very high. Therefore, f uh, the runoff is extremely fast. Flash floods are being, uh, being generated. Why is it happening? It seems to be that it happens more often. Is this a CNN phenomenon that, uh, you know, the, the news is when the, the postman bites the dog and not the other way around. So these news channels are full with disasters. And is it really a, a CNN phenomenon in the sense that we have real-time access to all the uh, disasters in the world? Or there is something out there such as changing hydrological cycle. This is what our profession is testing right now. The hypothesis being is as follows. The hydrological cycle is accelerating. That's the principal hypothesis. Now, it's, 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 um, what I'm going to tell you now is an extremely primitive model, but perhaps that gives you the gist of the whole thing. Imagine that there is a boundary up there in the, in the atmosphere that allows uh, uh, incoming radiation, uh, and there is the bouncing back effect, the outgoing radiation, and if greenhouse gases are pumped into the atmosphere, the outgoing radiation, uh, outgoing, uh, radiation is reduced. If that is the case, then the atmosphere is warming up. If the atmosphere is warming up, then there is more evaporation from the plants, uh, transpiration from the plants, and more evaporation from the, from the surfaces. If that happens, then there will be more clouds. If there are more clouds, there's a higher probability there will be more rain. If there is more rain, there will be more flow. If there is more flow, there will be more, more floods. That is, this, that is a very crude, simple, you know, at the bar stool type of discussion of, of climate change because there are many feedbacks in, in, in the system and a great deal of uncertainty. But it seems that the hydrological cycle is accelerating. Therefore, the probability of extremes is increasing. We will probably have more floods, but in order to keep the first law of thermodynamics at work, continuity, uh, uh, then we will have more droughts. And that's what we are observing, and we will show a, a few examples. Will this, inc uh, will, will this involve more risk? Absolutely. And the growing vulnerability? Absolutely. Because of the social fabric, people have the tendency to move back to the same areas which were hit by the disaster because of the land tenure system and because they are poor, the poor are the most vulnerable in this whole, whole system. Will there be less water for people? This is not a question, it's a fact. If you look at the past 40 years, in 1975, the per capita water availability in the world was about 15,000 cubic meter per person per year. Today, it's down to 5,000. Of course, you can't make a, a, a linear uh, projection and say that in 35 years, we will be running out of the water the uh, reason why you cannot do that is that water is a cycle, is, 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 a, is a renewable resource uh, that is turning around the water cycle or hydrological cycle. Then what is the crisis? If we are not running out of water because of the, the, the cycle that works now for nearly three billion years with varying speed, uh, then what is the, 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 the reason for the crisis? The reason is how we govern water. Basically, uh, our institutions, if, uh, and this is where social sciences and law and all the rest of it, sociology, anthropology are coming in. Because water is not a technical fix. Water is essentially a social issue. If it is a social issue, it's a political issue. And that we will also revisit. There, uh, sometimes people, you know, just for, Clarity. Sometimes people mix up governance with, with management, and there's a huge difference in it. Because in governance, you are asking yourself the question, what are the right things to do? Transparency, rule of law, women issue, transboundary, uh, transboundary watersheds, uh, great, great number of, of, of things which are set by society as opposed to management, when you have designed uh, these things which are right to do, how do you do things rightly? So that, how do you manage this whole thing? Whatever the case is, 
uh, this, the end of this story is that it seems that the hydrological cycle accelerates because of the climate uh, variability and the climate change. And it has always been the case, but now we seem to be in a situation uh, which, is, which is much worse than before. Now let's turn our attention to the drivers. What are the, the drivers? Imagine a place uh, where 96% of the population has no electricity, 60% of the horsepower required is from horses. More than 90% of the people have no lightning. Most live on, on subsistence farming. Flooding is a serious problem. Where is this country? It is not in a least, development, least developing country today, but this is in the United States, Tennessee Valley, in 1935. This has triggered, within the New Deal, this has triggered the Tennessee Valley uh, project, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which has altered the whole thing. So water is, uh, it was you, and water structures particularly, are a, a builder of prosperity uh, as, as well. Let us examine what are the key changes that are driving uh, the change of the system. We mentioned that the, the population growth has been threefold. Uh, the, the, the area of cropland has almost doubled, so natural ecosystems are, are, are disappearing. Dams are intercepting a great deal of, uh, uh, of runoff. But the important issue is, again, to look at this population growth that is unprecedented. Half of humanity, the Homo sapiens version of it, whoever lived, including Moses, Muhammad, Jesus, everybody. Half of them are contemporaries. That's a totally different ballgame. That changes not only the social fabric, but it does change the environment significantly. And environmental protection is not about tree hugging and, and all that stuff. Environmental protection is saving <coughs> ourselves. Because if we don't maintain and don't, don't sustain environmental services, that's a, that's a suicide. The best, perhaps, and this is an accelerating process. It took uh, roughly 14 years to reach where we are now. 7.3 billion people. Mind-boggling. If you go back in the, in the 50s, we had eight cities that exceeded you know, uh, in the, the 5 million in, inhabitants. Two years ago, the, the, the situation has been this. Uh, 80 cities are exceeding a population of 8, eight million. I was, uh, two weeks ago, I was in, in India, uh, in Bangalore, Bengaluru, uh, as it is called now, in Karnataka states. Uh, this is Bangalore here. Oops. Bangalore today, oops, Bangalore today, here, here, has 10.5 million people, the same as this little country. In 20 years' time, Bangalore being the IT industry, you know, half of the Indian uh, IT scientists are in Bangalore, the other half is in the Silicon Valley. Uh, it's a brilliant, brilliant place. Uh, in 20 years' time, Bangalore will have 30 million people, radically changing everything. And the critical issue there is that those guys have no water. They are over-pumping the aquifers. The aquifer level is dropping down 300 meters. They use more diesel pump, and it's a positive feedback, and then they reach the limit. How do you sustain a most important life support system, water resources? So what are then the global drivers? These are some options uh, from the population growth to technological changes, the internet revolution, no more digital divide, all the way down to climate. Who, 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 who votes for climate change as a principal driver? Who votes for population change as a principal driver? Uh, you guys are absolutely right, because this is what happens. And that's what many people don't understand. The media is, 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 is full with silly articles about, about the, the uh, you know, climate change and we are going to die and you know, start praying and all the rest of it. Uh, the, the, it's the human population growth. It's sufficient just to look at this figure, this triple exponential figure in the population growth. So it is population uh, that drives the principal changes. We have three big P's, as we used to say, uh, pollution, or population. <laughs> well, 
This was their Freud year. Yeah, okay. So this is the pollution, population, <laughs> pollution, and poverty. These are the big three drivers of what Professor Bogardi is going to talk about migration. Plus, corrupt political regimes, corrupt politicians, corrupt everything. Superimposed upon all this is the impact of climate change and climate variability. A few years back, I, uh, the International Herald Tribune was still existing. There was a huge headline news in one of the, the issues of the Herald Tribune is that climate change is on. Down to pray. Well, ladies and gentlemen, climate change is on for four billion years. Uh, if there were no climate change, we would not be here. Very simple. And the Brontosauri was still hopping in, in, in Kursa very happily. Let's see what actually happens uh, and, and what happened, what happened in, the, in, in the past, uh, say, 50,000 years. The climate has been changing, sometimes very, very abruptly, until some 10,000 years ago, which is this part, is uh, zoomed up here a little bit, enlarged, is a, a period of a relative, relatively stable climate, the so-called Holocene. This is when the humans started to do agriculture. This is when uh, the sedentary approaches were, 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 were changing. But even if you look at the past uh, 10,000 years, there were ups and downs, such as the, the, the mini ice age in the 16th century, those of you who know the, the Flemish painters, uh, Bruegel and, and Boss and all those guys, uh, they see that the Dutch were happily skating every, 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 every winter. And now they're happy only every uh, 12th year because simply the canals are not, are not frozen. Versus the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the hot period during uh, Julius Caesar. And then they say, some people say that the relatively warm climate helped Julius Caesar a great deal uh, to conquer the world. And that, of course, is linked to, to migration ever since we moved out from Africa. The history of humanity is nothing but a series of, of migrations. So migration is not a bad guy. Migration is the very nature uh, of, of, uh, of humanity. Let's go back, however, uh, uh, to the data, what they show. They show that sometimes we, we have to be a little bit more careful about how we interpret the data. Because there are uh, events which are distorting our observations. Uh, just a, uh, this is the, the, uh, the time series of uh, temperature in, in the West Point Military Academy, which is what, 100 miles north of New York roughly, right? Uh, versus uh, the Central Park. No, no, this is the Central Park, and the relatively stable is the West Point. Why? Because of the heat island. Manhattan has been built up, and the, the data were distorted. So what do we know then about uh, climate change? We know is that the climate has started to behave strangely in, in, in the 20th. There were certain things which we were able to uh, uh, explain by uh, the greenhouse gas, uh, gases, but there were others which we were not. The conclusion of this, however, is that uh, reducing emissions alone, and this is what the Paris Agreement is all about, is not sufficient. It took 200 years for humanity, ever since the Industrial Revolution, that we tampered with the climate, and in 200 years we changed the climate. It's not going to change back to a, a near equilibrium in one year time, the Paris Agreement, with all due respect to that, or even in 20 years time. This is a long-term thing. The Paris Agreement was about setting a threshold by the end of this century, 1.5 degrees. If we go beyond that, then instabilities will occur, which will have very negative uh, impacts. So basically, the, the, the reducing emission and the Paris Agreement is about energy, what we pump into the, uh, the atmosphere. This is called mitigation versus adaptation, which is through, with, and by water. How we adopt to the, uh, to the uh, changing uh, climates. Because the impacts could be uh, pretty bad. Uh, if we have uh, uh, more than five degrees by the end of this century uh, temperature increase, then basically our systems will collapse. That is why it's so, it is so important uh, to keep to the Paris Agreement. Whatever will be the case, water hazards in the coming decades 
up to the end of the century will, will pose a very important problem. In order to deal with it, we have non-structural measures and structural measures, but structural measures take decades uh, to, to build up. What happened uh, over the past uh, years, is, uh, as I mentioned before, is that within the same year we had serious floods in one side of the world with serious droughts on the other side of the world. Uh, yeah, just a, a short uh, uh, rundown of some of the, 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 the most unexpected and most severe uh, floods. In Pakistan in August 2010, 40 billion US dollar damage. Uh, basically, it, it, it almost washed out. Uh, Pakistan economy. It was an incredible disaster. A month later, in Seoul, never seen uh, urban flooding, urban flash floods. A month later, in, Bris in Rio de Janeiro, the favelas were washed off uh, from, from the mountains because of the torrent, torrent rain. A month later, or the same, same month actually, Brisbane, flood uh, those who, of you who have been in Brisbane is a very safe place. But in that year, sharks were coming up on the main street and not, not, uh, not cars. So very new things are, are happening. For instance, if you would like to look at the Rhine uh, from the perspective of, a, uh, of a, a jewelry shop, this is how the Rhine looks like from a jewelry shop. Now, three years back, there was a huge, the biggest flood in, on the Danube, which has almost uh, washed away the Hungarian parliament. Well, some say too, but it didn't happen. But uh, finally, <laughs> finally, it, 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 it survived it. Yet, there are some <laughs> who are a, a, a bit skeptical uh, about uh, climate change. If you look at the reality, what are the losses in terms of, uh, of the GDP? Southeast Asia is very vulnerable. And interestingly enough, uh, southeast or, or eastern part of Europe Never seen floods in Croatia, uh, in Serbia, uh, and in Slovenia. And they have all the structures, very well designed engineering structures. But those events were outliers. They never happened before. Strange phenomena occurred. Uh, as, as land prices are going up in the developing world, you know, developed world, more and more life is going underground in terms of shopping malls, in terms of movies, ice skating, and this is what happened in, in, in Japan, in Fukuoka. I borrowed this slide from the United Nations uh, University. A sudden flash flood that occurred basically in 10 seconds. Luckily, no human, uh, no human uh, life uh, uh, was, uh, was, was lost. But it's a, it's, 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 it's a frightening new uh, phenomenon. Versus aridity, Lake Mead. It's not being filled up now for seven years. The, the bad news uh, also for the, uh, for, the, for the future is that things are not going to improve. This tendency of warming up is probably, probably is, is increasing. So that's why we had the Paris Agreement, and that's why we had a very important dialogue between the political community and the scientific community. Although uh, some leaders consider it more like a, a boxing match, um, uh, religious beliefs versus science, uh, and this certainly shouldn't apply here. Science has, has said what is expected. So climate change is all about water. This is the principal message which I would like uh, you to, to leave with, and is a key to sustainability. What is it what we have a choice? Not much. Basically what we have as a, as a choice is we have to increase the resilience of our systems the ability to turn back to the near equilibrium state where it has been before. Not exactly the same thing, but within a, a, a corridor. It's not stability, resilience, but it's, a, it's the, 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 the ability of the system to return to a near equilibrium uh, state. Uh, so essentially, uh, this is what uh, happens in, in nature. If, if water is not immediately available, you have to apply adaptive water resources management technologies and then find where water is basically, basically is. What are the adaptation options? First of all, more storage. To store excess water for the period when there is a, a dry period. More hydropower, which is a, 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 an environmentally sound uh, uh, technology. More groundwater use, 
but very carefully because groundwater is an extremely vulnerable uh, resource. All of these, however, are potential sources of conflict. And this country has been loaded with hydropower conflicts over the past 30 years, even today. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's there. But that's uh, political science. I'm not going to go into that. What I'm going to show, however, is that how much water influences the economic capability of a, a, a country. I took two examples, Zimbabwe and Ethiopia. If you look at the two graphs, the precipitation versus the GDP, what you will see is that there's an extremely strong correlation. So therefore, uh, for the dry years, those countries have no other option in Africa but to increase uh, their storage capacity because that is the backbone of, uh, of, of wealth. If you look at what happened over the past century in North America, where in North America the per capita reservoir space per person is about 6,000 cubic meter, then in Ethiopia it's 43. And that determines very strongly the, the, the economic outlooks of, of a country. Of course, that changes uh, the environment. Uh, because it's a drastic uh, uh, intrusion into the, into the equilibrium. Case in point is a reservoir built up in the United States. Uh, in the days of the founding fathers, there were two dozen uh, reservoirs in east, on the east, east coast. Today, there are 86,000 reservoirs in the United, uh, United States. Which, which played a very important role in vast generation. Now let's look at the impact. What are the impacts? First of all, ever since the Industrial Revolution, we have an exponential increase in the carbon dioxide release. Uh, that yielded a, a, a linear trend, an increase in, in the temperature. But watch out, uh, the regular observations, climate observations, are no longer than 150 years. So what you have is basically you have a window, a finite window, 150 years, and you would like to see through the window what happened in the past and what, happened, what will happen in the future. That means that there's a huge uncertainty that is related to, uh, to that. And what we also see is an exponential increase in the anthropogenic nitrogen fixation. Similarly, we see an exponential increase in the uh, fluxes, nitrogen fluxes to coastal zones because of this pollution issue which I mentioned. Likewise, we see an, an exponential increase in the loss of tropical rainforest. Likewise, we see an, an exponential increase in the species extension. Everything seems to be exponentially increasing, including the number of McDonald's restaurants. The morale of this story, however, is very important. It, the lesson is that age-old hypotheses are dead. Namely, that the future is going to be the same as it was in the past, which is the principle of stationarity that statistical parameters of the processes do not change. The future is not going to be the, the, the same. Uh, a small uh, example, if I may say, I was in Prague uh, uh, almost 20, no, no, 15 years ago. It was a huge flood. Uh, so much that the, the water entered the, the metro system in Prague and basically knocked it out from operation for six months. And I was at a press conference and one of the journalists asked, how often does it happen? Uh, well, I said, well, you know, I learned it from the uh, uh, Czech hydrologists who are brilliant, that this is a flood, a so-called 200-year flood, that occurs once in 200 years. He said, well, this is all right, but last year we also had a big flood, and then the, the hydrologists have said this was a 200-year flood. I said, look, it can happen because our statistical hypothesis include the independence of the samples, identical distribution, homogeneity, and all the rest of it. So therefore, in principle, it could happen that the last year flood occurred in the last year of the previous 200 years, while the one now is, is the first year of the next 200 years. It's statistically, that is OK. But he said that, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's OK. But the year before the last time, we also had a 200-year flood. So that, that, that again suggests that the stationarity principle upon which the building of bridges, the design of waterways, everything depends, is not valid anymore. And this is a huge challenge for our science to build up process models which describes 
how these things are linked. Socioeconomic systems, bio, uh, geochemical uh, uh, systems with the various life support systems. And over the past 20 years, there's been a tremendous progress in this regard, ever since we don't have a, basically a digital uh, uh, limit in, in computing. So we are able now to simulate uh, possible scenarios. What will happen? This is the, I uh, uh, borrowed it from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change a few years back because now we have a, a much better uh, projection. The, what could happen by the end of the, this century? Temperature increase between 1.5 and between, between 6 degrees. 6 degrees is basically the doomsday scenario. So now these are much more uh, precise. However, this is still a scenario analysis and not a, a, a prediction. Will we have more floods? Well, I have indicated that here, that probably yes. We will have uh, an accelerated hydrological cycle, yes. If that is the case, that the per capita water availability is decreasing, will there be a, a war over water uh, or not? This is a, 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 a question that people often, often ask. Obviously, because they, it's a fixed amount, 41,000 cubic kilometer uh, a year, Versus the number of users who are triple exponentially increasing. The conflict potential is there. Indeed, if you look at the, the international uh, the transboundary uh, river basins, uh, river basins that are shared by two or more uh, nations, then you see that 40% uh, of humanity lives in transboundary basins or aquifers. So by 2050, when we will have 9 billion uh, users, that basically means uh, more or less the current uh, world population. There are already some, uh, uh, some basins where we have uh, 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 skirmishes, where we have uh, some concerns. These are the usual suspects, the Nile Basin, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Tigris-Euphrates Basin, the Aral uh, Sea Basin. Uh, they all have a, a fairly strong uh, uh, conflict uh, uh, potential. So will there be a war? Let's have a look at the usual suspects. Many people talk about the Nile as a potential source. Indeed, when the Ethiopians started to build up the Renaissance Dam a few years back, there was a, a, a very strong conflict, political conflict between Egypt uh, and, and, and Ethiopia. But now through negotiations, they seem to get to an agreement. Or if you look at uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Middle East uh, uh, over the, the, the Jordan, uh, there is an agreement. The, uh, the, the Palestine Water Authority director daily talks to the Israeli uh, Water Authority director. Uh, and that's more or less independent of, of, of politics. Or if you look at the, the Ganges Brahmaputra Magna system, uh, between Bangladesh and India, there were very serious problems some 20 years back. But now it, it, it works. They came to agreements that are working. There is a, a, a base in the Tigris Euphrates basin, but indeed there is a war for a liquid, but the, the color is somewhat different. So it's, uh, and the viscosity is also different. Uh, this, is, this is a huge issue, and nobody knows what will the, the, the fin final game will be. But what very few know is that a, a potential conflict is in the RRC basin. After the, the Soviet Union uh, uh, breakup, uh, the upstream countries and the, the, the downstream countries developed uh, uh, a conflict over water use, particularly Tajikistan versus Uzbekistan, uh, particularly over the reservoir projects of the Tajiks, because the 90% the of the water is generated by the, the upstream countries, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, where the use, most of the use is happening downstream, Turkestan and, and, and Uzbekistan, and that there is a, a potential conflict. And of course, the, always as the case is that the, the poorest are the most vulnerable. Now let me just uh, turn to the final uh, chapter, final section, the data issue, starting with a very simple dictum. If you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And this is what the politicians normally forget. That, for instance, in Africa, the number one cutback in, in, in government spending is the operational expenses of hydrometeorological services. That is why we have now less hydrological data in Africa than in Germany. Uh, and that is a huge, huge risk, in spite of the fact that over the past 20 years, an incredible progress occurred in data capturing technologies. Now, we have now satellites uh, which are connected, uh, the GRACE uh, experiment that measures the, the 
the gravitational anomalies of the Earth. The Earth is not a, a globe, really. It's not a, a, a perfect. It's like a potato. Uh, so th this measures the surface of the, of the, of the potato. And then when uh, there is a huge body under the Earth that may change the gravitational field, then the first uh, satellite is trying to fall into that uh, hole. And that laser beam is not physically connected. The laser beam measures the displacement from which we can have a, a conclusion how big that water body is. For instance, very few people know that the biggest amount of water in the world is under the Sahara in the great uh, Nubian sandstone aquifer. And now with the satellite technology, we are able to go look down 4,000 meters, which was unbelievable even 15 years ago. We have now uh, real-time meteorological services, precipitation forecast. You can, you, can, you can manage your tennis matches just by looking at an application. But the science which is in behind that is, is incredible of the past 40 years. We had uh, uh, systems, we have systems now which are integrating from data capturing to the applications. In Japan, you have a, an app on your iPhone that you leave, uh, or in five years' time, you will, have, you will be walking in water up to your knees. Uh, uh, this is a very simple statement, but the science which is behind it is very, very uh, complex. We have now uh, four dozen, at least, environmental satellites. These are non, not spy satellites, but these are measuring <coughs> environmental processes. So there's a huge <coughs> amount of data that is coming to the, uh, to the, to the world, uh, and then we can have time series of, of how things are happening in time over a certain location, and we can tie them and have a, an overall picture of what happens in the world. Every single day, huge amount of data is coming. Exabytes of data are being streamed every single day. An exabyte is one zero, and uh, one, 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 and 18 zeros. That's a pretty big number. Uh, so how do you manage uh, those data? What sort of real-time algorithms you have that enable you to find a pattern. Uh, are there are all sorts of tools, particularly artificial intelligence tools, which are coming up to do that. The heart of the matter, matter is modeling uh, the processes. And again, there has been an incredible uh, progress over the past uh, uh, 25 years. Uh, Janos's father was my, my professor of hydrodynamics at the University of Technology in Budapest. In, in those days, uh, we have been dealing with these little models uh, you know, ships are going on and what happens, analog physical uh, models. Uh, when I graduated, this was a big, big thing that how to solve a very simple partial differential equation. You can be a doctor of science. Now, if you don't know, know that, how to do that, you flag the examination. My students were dealing with these kind of things. How the sediment and water is interacting, which is a very, very complex problem. How do you uh, calculate a three-dimensional uh, velocity field is a very complex calculation, but it's doable now. So we have so many good models that the only problem here, what, what we are facing, is how to select the best model, which was obviously the best uh, occupation of my students. We have uh, forecasting uh, methods and al algorithms that are so precise uh, based on error feedback and the learning, learning algorithms that it was not even imaginable 15 uh, years ago. Huge progress, no doubt, in satellite data, data simulation, simulation model, GIS, everything is, is, is available. Yet, our capacity is limited, and particularly when it comes to the calibration of the global circulation models. Most of the time, those models are calibrated against data from North America, Western Europe, Japan, South Korea, the Murray Darling Basin, and New Zealand. A whole continent like Africa has a very few data. So this is a common responsibility to provide services for the Africans that they would be able to collect data for the common good. Uh, otherwise, if we, if, otherwise the, the, all the calibrated models will yield biased results because data are missing from Africa. So at the end, uh, this is what I would like to leave you with uh, and then uh, take it over to Janos. The time of easy water is over. So we, we, that we, we will have a problem which will be with us for a, a few years. Where do, go, do, where do we go from here? What are the lessons? First of all, will there be enough water in the 21st century? <laughs> 
is there more technology that is the answer? Now, if somebody says that, then you should ask the person, what was the question? Because that more technology alone is not the answer. It, it, it lives in how society is dealing with this problem. It, technology is a part of the, 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 the answer only. We need to generate, first of all, the political will that the political community acts upon what science is saying. We need to generate the capacities, particularly in Africa, to do it right. And we need to, to generate the, the resources. Water, at the end of the day, is an ethical issue. Sharing and caring. And what sort of capacities do we have there? Capacity development is the key uh, to the issues. And that's the center of the sustainable development goals. The 17 goals, which are extremely ambitious. Heads of states and governments made a pledge two years ago in New York. And they said that by 2030, we will eliminate poverty. This is goal number one. There will be no more hunger in 15 years. Now, I mean, 15 from here. Two years out. Yeah, 13. Yeah. This, is, this is a huge thing. Although it's not, again, a, a, a binding thing, but it's, uh, it's very, very important, of which was a big debate that water should be a part. And then finally, we managed to have water as a very important goal. And perhaps it's my professional bias to say that water is the centerpiece of the SDGs. Because that's what connects poverty, hunger, energy, everything. If you move out water from the SDGs, the system is collapsing. So we will be in business for some time. We have a, 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 the political implications. Uh, 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 President Turk, Turk will come here next week, I guess. He chairs a, a session on, on uh, we just finished the report on water and peace, which is very, very interesting, and I'm sure he will talk about it. The challenge at the day, uh, what we all have, is how to put water in the minds of people. So I will leave you with a, 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 a quotation, which is my favorite from JFK. Anybody who can solve the problems of water will be worthy of two Nobel Prizes, one for peace and one for science. Thank you for your attention.